I'm Emily. And I'm Hannah. We are best friends and dietitians. We have a goal of challenging nutrition misinformation and fitness trends with an evidence-based approach. Each episode, we will dish up our thoughts about the latest facts on a popular health-related topic. We're the Upbeat Dietitians. Hello, guys. Welcome to the podcast. Today, we are joined by a very special guest, Colleen Christensen. Colleen is a RD who believes in the power of food freedom through her social media channels, her blog, her videos, and her incredibly popular membership community called the Society with an I-E-A-T-Y, like eat. It's very cute. She helps women to stop dieting and start fueling their bodies intuitively without food rules. As a dietitian, Colleen knows the importance of nutrition, but also that there's this unhealthy obsession that can be very detrimental to our health. So finding the balance we're all striving for isn't a mystical unicorn. It's 180% within everyone's reach. And Colleen guides and inspires others to find the style of food freedom that feels good, both mentally and physically. Be sure to enjoy today's episode. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Uppy Dietitians podcast. Hello, everybody. Colleen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, thank you so, so much. Well, today we really want to get into intuitive eating and more specifically gentle nutrition. We know, Colleen, you're very passionate about that. You talk really great things about it on your Instagram page and elsewhere, of course. So we really want to get into that today. But before we do, kind of walk us through a day in the life, what you do for work, education, hobbies, all that fun stuff. Yes, I will try to condense it as much as possible. Um, A day in the life now looks like me. I'm currently sitting in my basement office, my beagles over there somewhere on the couch. And I am a private practice dietitian. I have an online membership community and I teach just like what you said, intuitive eating with a gentle nutrition focus, which I'm sure we'll dive into exactly what that means for everyone who's listening is like, what does that even mean? We'll get into it, but really I do so many things. I, today was an Instagram content day. I do YouTube. I do coaching calls in the society, creating new videos, all of these different things, writing. Um, so I'm really aware of a lot of hats. And I think that's why I love my career so much. I was talking to my husband about this the other day when we were walking our dog and I was like, I really just feel like this was, this career makes sense to me. I was always a very creative person, even back in my childhood, in high school. And I feel like it's all come together now. And I never expected my career to turn out this way. I went to school to be a dietitian kind of on a whim. I've always liked food. I knew I didn't want to do anything that was too serious or, you know, punching things into a calculator or anything, you know, you just, what you think of like a typical job, you know, I knew that wasn't up my alley. So my mom suggested it and I was like, sure, let's go for it. So kind of just went on a whim, didn't know necessarily what I was going to do with that career, but it, the way it unfolded is I ended up working for about four years in inborn errors of metabolism. So very, very specific genetic disorders and very, biochemical. So for everyone who's a dietitian that's listening and being like, I'm never going to know, need to know any of those things again. Yeah. All the stuff they said you didn't need to know was the stuff I needed to know. And I needed to know it like the back of my hand because lives were at stake. So it was a very interesting career, but I knew that it wasn't something that just lit me up, you know, and the further along that I got in my own recovery from disordered eating, because it was really in college when I struggled. And I get the question of a lot of, did working to become a dietitian cause my disordered eating? And I don't think so. I think that it was just the perfect storm of my personality being very kind of obsessive about things and type A, it was a coping mechanism for my stress. Um, So I really struggled in college. And then when I started my career in metabolism is when I started really that healing process, really during my internship and during the earlier stages of my career. But then the further that I got along 
I realized that, you know what, I think I have to step in and be the person that I didn't have during my own recovery, because the way that it kind of all unfolded is I just stumbled upon intuitive eating and it was after a lot of trial and error, trying to figure out how do I make this work? How do I tie in health and nutrition to this intuitive eating non-diet framework? And like I said, I just really felt like I had to be the person that I didn't have because I could have sidestepped a whole bunch of stress and, you know, taking two steps forward, three steps back. So that's really how I got where I am today. I teach all about not having food rules with that focus on Jed's nutrition. And yeah, that's my little, my little spiel in a nutshell. I love how you say you stumbled upon it because same hundred percent. I think how I like learned about intuitive eating and how I like wanted to like how I knew I wanted to do that as a dietitian myself was Instagram. Like I saw other mm-hmm. RDs doing it and talking about it. And I was like, that's so different from what we learn in school for the most part, um, which is a whole other conversation. That could be a whole podcast itself. Um, but same, it's just kind of cool how you can stumble upon that. And then it becomes like this whole career. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Also, it's so cool. I, I'm, I knew there, there has to be a place for all dietitians and all different aspects of like disease and whatnot, but inborn metabolism just sounds <laughs> so scary to me from the aspect of like biochemistry and me, like not friends. <laughs> yes. And yeah, I just think that it's, I like, I like having that as my background because I understand the human body very, very well. I understand the way that our food digests very, very well. And I still advocate for this non-diet approach. It's like, I've had years studying, like I said, the breakdown of everything. And it just goes to show you that, yeah, this is still what I recommend knowing all of, all of that. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Well, that's a great segue yeah. actually into our first official question. Um, so back in the day when we first started this podcast, Emily and I did an episode on intuitive eating, kind of walked through the 10 principles, but that was forever ago and we love getting other perspectives. So Colleen, walk us, walk us through what intuitive eating is and kind of explain like, is it just another diet? Is it just kind of like eating whatever you want? What, what the heck is it? What is intuitive eating? Yes. Now there's lots of ways that you can look at intuitive eating. And I think that one thing that's important to know is that it's going to look different for every single person. So we kind of take this, I take like a zoomed out lens when I give kind of a definition and I say it is a non-diet approach to nutrition and health and the way we eat. And it's really looking for your own, you are in control. You are in the driver's seat of your food choices versus a diet, which sets these guidelines for us, which tells us what we can, cannot eat, or we should, or what we should not eat. And with intuitive eating, you are using your intuition. It's coming from you based on what you know, both this is what my body wants. I'm hungry. I am craving X, Y, Z, but also the biggest thing that people forget is that our brain is a part of our body too. So it takes into consideration our health knowledge that we have in the way that I like to kind of explain it is if we picture a Venn diagram, you know, those two overlapping circles, intuitive eating is really the middle area between our internal wisdom, knowledge, those cravings, desires, hunger cues with the external knowledge that we have. So the health information, you know, all of those things, the nutrition information, intuitive eating, like I said, very, very summed up version is kind of the, the overlap of that. We're taking both of those things into consideration in our food choices. Now there might be one time when our craving, I just really want the chocolate. So then we have the chocolate. There might be another time when we're like, I just perfect example. I wanted something sweet and I'm obsessed you guys with these freeze-dried mangoes from Aldi. They're so good. And I was like, you know, I want something a little sweet. Okay. You know what? You know, I'm fine with anything. So I'll use a little gentle nutrition and get something with, you know, some other, other nutrient benefits in there with having the mango. So those circles, they can ebb and flow. They're not stagnant, but that's really kind of what it is in a nutshell. So a lot of people ask, you know, oh, intuitive eating, it's just not caring about nutrition or just eating whatever I want. And you can eat whatever you want, but it's not just impulse, right? I could have gone, we also this weekend got some crumble cookies. I could have 
ate in all the crumble cookies that we have, but I'm also thinking what's going to make me feel good. What is going to make, you know, my body feel best. And I didn't want to eat those. So yes, I could eat anything that I want to, but it's more of an empowered choice for me to decide, do I want to have some of the cookie? Do I not want to have some of the cookie? Um, so it's, like I said, a non-diet approach to nutrition. And I think the biggest thing is it's so much more complicated than what we see on Instagram. On Instagram, we just see those impulses. We just see, you can eat the cookies, so eat the cookies. And I think that's what trips a lot of people up. And that is why I really have the focus on judge nutrition, because that's where I personally got really stuck too, was cool. I can eat the donuts and the pizza and the cookies and all these things, but how do we allow that nutrition side of things of, you know, that circle of the Venn diagram to come back into play without it totally taking over like it did for me for so long, or kind of just ping ponging back between these circles and not having overlap. So I hope that answered your question on what intuitive eating is and a little bit of a roundabout way. I feel like you also already started answering the next question too, which is perfect, (laughs) Um, which is kind of what is gentle nutrition. But I think you did a really good job of everyone. I feel like explains it a little bit differently. And I really like how you went about explaining it and kind of from the health standpoint and also talking about how when we are kind of having those cravings, the different types of choices you can make, you don't just have to like for example, like you didn't have to just eat the crumble cookies if you were having something sweet. If you were having like a, the dried mango, that's something that I definitely agree gets lost a lot in the social media world because yes. it's very much like advocating. I feel like there's a lot of advocation. I don't know if that's a word. Ad- advocation. Advocacy? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For uh, honoring your cravings, but there isn't kind of that aspect of kind of our mindset around what we're choosing to eat and whatnot. Yes. And but. what, so something that I say, cause it can be get confusing on, okay, when do I implement gen nutrition? When do I not? And really kind of summaring that up again, gen nutrition is a non-obsessive way to go about nutrition information. It is just that it is gentle, right? So one thing that I like to say is you could almost put your choices through a filter and you could ask yourself, okay, would implementing judge nutrition. So let's say the cookie or the mangoes, would that take away from my satisfaction and enjoyment with this eating experience for me just now, the answer was no. Like, I just want something sweet. I'm going to be satisfied with either of these options. So sure. Sure, I'll implement the judge nutrition, but there was a time earlier today where I did want some of the cookie. And if I would have said, okay, I'll have the mangoes in, you know, the name of quote unquote health, I was probably going to probably eat way more of those past fullness, trying to hit the spot with something that's not going to hit the spot. And I probably would have gone back to the cookies anyway, because I had to satisfy that craving. So I like to kind of use that question as a filter of when do I implement gems nutrition? Cause it can get confusing. And another thing that we should know is the focus on gents nutrition is not where we start. And I'm sure if you, any of the listeners have, you know, heard your previous episode on intuitive eating, they know, okay, gents nutrition is saved for later. And that is true. The focus is saved until later in the journey, but I don't think that that means you can't ever think about nutrition in the earlier stages of intuitive eating. And I think that's something that I love and hate social media, like so many of us do, because it really, really oversimplifies intuitive eating. Yes, we want gen nutrition, the focus to be later in the journey, but in the beginning, especially as we're establishing our hunger and fullness cues, that is one of the first things that I teach is we focus first on the biological side of things. So giving our body carbs, fat, protein, enough energy throughout the day. And there is a little bit of gentle nutrition that we need to think about there. For example, macronutrients, are we having those at, you know, each meal, are we getting enough food overall? And then we switch to more of kind of the psychological side of food. So breaking our food rules, overcoming emotional eating, not having that be our only coping mechanism. And then we get to more of the focus on gen nutrition. So gen nutrition can be seeded a little bit throughout, but the key thing 
another key question to ask yourself with Gems Nutrition is to say, for instance, let's go back to the cookie and mango example. If I were to have the two options and I were to say, okay, I'm going to have the mangoes be, you know, for a little gym nutrition in my day, you have to ask yourself, would I feel guilt, stress, or anxiety if I were to have the cookie? That signals a food rule, not a food preference for gym nutrition. And in that instance, which is where a lot of people start with intuitive eating, we need to work on making peace with the cookies in allowing ourselves to eat them, removing that guilt before we can really shift to gym nutrition. Because if we don't do that, we're kind of just avoiding the cookies and avoiding that food rule. And I kind of describe it like, you're kind of building a house with no solid foundation that's been poured. It's all just going to come tumbling down, like maybe eating a cookie or we go out to dinner or something like that. And we only have an option that we think is quote unquote bad. All that work is going to kind of come tumbling down. So we really need to lay that solid foundation first and then focus on judge nutrition. But I want everyone to know that that's kind of in my mind, the goal we want to get you to, at least I want to get everyone to implementing judge nutrition because I'm a registered dietitian. I care about your health. I care about people feeling good with intuitive eating. And that is one thing I hear over and over and over again is, okay, I'm doing intuitive eating. I'm you know, eating all the cookies, I'm eating the pizza. It's great, but I feel like crap. And I was in that place too. And it sucks. And the, my response says, oh man, I feel you. But the good news is that you're not totally eating intuitively because you haven't gotten to gym nutrition. And that's a good thing. That means you have more learning to do. That means there's, you know, kind of this hope for this. So I kind of get excited when not, I'm not excited that people aren't feeling well, but I get excited because I'm like, cool, there's more to learn. You're, you have, you know, there's more room to grow here. And that's really I think what ties it all together is gym nutrition after you've made peace with food. That is, I'm like getting excited right now because that's the secret sauce. That is where everyone envisions being where you're like, cool, I can have the crumble cookies on my counter and I can still, you know, snack on the carrots and hummus if I want to. It's that quote unquote balance or moderation that everyone's looking for, but it just comes easy because you don't have to strive for it with gym nutrition. The way I teach it is a feelings-based approach versus a telling approach. And I think that's one really big differentiator between gym nutrition and a diet. I might be giving you similar advice, honestly, to what the diet is telling you. For instance, I'm obviously not going to tell you, you have to eat X, Y, Z, but fruits and veggies are great for our bodies, right? A diet that you follow may also tell you that, but I think the biggest difference is again, you're in the driver's seat. You have full control over not touching a vegetable ever again in your life. You have the power to do that, but do you want to? And that's where I think it's really important to connect the way we feel with the way that we're eating. Okay. If we're eating donuts every day and it doesn't feel good. Okay. Let's pocket that nugget of wisdom. What would make it feel good, right? You have this innate drive desire to implement gym nutrition because you understand the way that it makes you, your body feel the way that it impacts your body. And I can just nerd out. I'm like rambling on, but I just nerd out about this stuff because it's so fascinating to me. And I personally never, never thought that I'd be able to get to this place where I wasn't swinging on the pendulum from super restrictive hashtag clean to literally binge eating like everything that the CVS store on my college campus had. I never thought I'd get to this place. So anyone listening, if you're like, oh, that's like, sounds great, but it's never going to happen for me. It can, it literally happens for thousands of people every single day. And it can happen for you too. I'm like getting giddy at you getting giddy. I just love (laughs) it so much. I love it so much. That was so well put. I especially love the part how you mentioned that the gentle nutrition part kind of comes later, but we have to kind of do it in the beginning a little bit too. Like when I see clients one-on-one, if I were just like, okay, just eat whatever, good luck, like listen to your body. They wouldn't really learn much from that. And Mm -hmm. although it's true, they do get to eat whatever they want and listen to their body. They're not learning about how, at least for me in that instance, that would have happened. They wouldn't be learning about how protein keep them full and Mm -hmm. how getting lots of fiber would be good for their bowel movements and that sort of thing. And so we do have to incorporate it a little bit, like you said, but 
it's it can be hard to fully embrace it when you haven't figured out the other parts of intuitive eating first. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think that is, I loved everything you said, but specifically, I really liked kind of the thought process you took us through of like deciding the food choices and like you're in the driver's seats. Cause that's something that we haven't really gone in that much depth on here at any point. So I'm really glad you were able to kind of talk that through. Cause I feel like a lot of people, their minds are going to be blown. When yeah, and I, I love talking through this. So I am one of those people. It's funny. This might be a little controversial, but I do full days of eating. And I know that some people love them. Some people hate them. And I think if you can do them the right way, they're very, very beneficial. So the way that I do them is literally just like that. I don't focus on how much I'm eating or necessarily what I'm eating. I intentionally keep like portion sizes and whatnot ambiguous. Um, and I talk about, okay, you know what? It's lunchtime. This is, I, you know, maybe it's more of a craving that I'm satisfying. Why did I pick this meal? Um, and I think that that is, if again, every, all my work, I ask myself, what would have really helped me when I was trying to figure all of this stuff out? And I think that if someone could kind of showed me, like, it's not necessarily one thing of this is why I'm eating this meal. It's kind of this like I said, we kind of put things through filters. We have to think about what we have on hand, what is accessible. Um, yes, nutrition, also our cravings. And so I just, I love doing that. Just kind of like walking people through it because for me it happens. And I think that that's important to note too, is that all of this stuff, like if you're thinking right now, maybe you're in the beginning of your journeys or you're just thinking, okay, I think general general nutrition is what I'm missing. If you're thinking, oh my gosh, Colleen, I have to ask myself all these questions every time I have a meal, like that is so overwhelming. It gets automatic. So what I really like to do is take that. Okay. What took me two seconds to make that choice that I was going to have leftover pasta for dinner or for lunch. Let's let me dissect that for you and show you kind of like how I got to that food choice. And then you can see, I love doing this in my Instagram stories too. The days where I have, you know, a cookie, this is why I had that. This is why I had the frozen mangoes because I think when we see, especially on social media, okay, someone snacked on mangoes, they just think, okay, mangoes are good. Mangoes are, you know, what I should be doing too, but there's so much more nuance to our food choices. And like, like I've kind of said, it's going to look different for every single person. So let's say I had a medical need, let's say I had celiac disease and I had to restrict gluten, right? You can be an intuitive eater and still have those, right? I like to see it again. That's your piece of gentle nutrition. That is your empowered choice to say, you know what? I'd really like it if my stomach didn't like feel like it got torn apart. So I'm going to not eat the gluten, right? Same thing for someone who might have, you know, lactose intolerance. You can go eat as much ice cream as you want. You have the power to do that. Someone with a peanut allergy, you could go eat all the peanuts that you want. The question is, do you want to go into anaphylactic shock? Like that's really, you get to decide, is this something that I want to do? You are really in the driver's seat. So like I said, it's going to look different for everyone. It's going to look different day to day. Um, and I think sometimes that's, what's really hard about it for people to wrap their mind around because we're so used to just give me what to eat. Just give me a diet. And I always like to tell people, I'm not going to tell you what to eat. I'm going to teach you how to eat. And I think that's really what a lot of people are missing is how do I even, how do I eat again? Yeah. I saw another RD coin her, what I eat in a day as a, why I eat in a day, which I just love because, um, like you've been saying, why we make the choice is so much more important than what the choice actually is. Mm -hmm. It's going to be different for every single person. And I also want to say that I love the phrase empowered choice that you keep mentioning. I really love that. I love it too. Yes. And I think that that's really what we're needing. I mean, we need to just take, take the power back from dieting, take the power back from food and allow yourself to make your own choices. Yes. We just, we need to feel empowered around food, our bodies, nutrition, all the things. Yeah. I always talk about with clients, how good it feels to be in the driver's seat. Like we want to like, feel like we're actually in control of our food choices rather than the other way around. When we just feel like we're scrambling, we have no say, like, it's just like a mad, a mad mess. It just feels so good to be in that driver's seat. But Colleen, we want to hear, or I know our listeners definitely will want to hear how they can 
incorporate or even start incorporating gentle nutrition into their life. If you have like yes. any like easy tips or like, like gentle nutrition for starters, just so because everyone's probably a different, a very different place. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've got, I got you here. So <laughs> I'm like getting excited. So I think the, like I said, the first, it's really like a pyramid. So the base of the pyramid, like I said, is you have strong hunger and fullness cues. We under, we're not restricting any food groups. It's not like we, oh my gosh, I can't touch bread with a 10 foot pole. We want to make sure we overcome that, um, before we get into the gen nutrition, but Really, there's a couple, really four pieces that I recommend starting with Gen Nutrition. And the first one is going to be macronutrients. So carbs, fat, and protein. Do we have those at each meal in some capacity? And then at snacks, I usually like to recommend two out of the three to give your snack a little more staying power, give you a little bit longer lasting energy. So trying that. And then we have fiber. Fiber is also a really more basic piece of junk nutrition that you can start with. That can be fruits and veggies. That can be whole grains that can be beans, but just kind of adding a little bit of fiber in there. It is. I love fiber. You guys, I like nerd out fiber and vitamin D might be (laughs) randomly like my most favorite nutrients, but fiber is, it really makes such a big difference for me and my meals, keeping me feeling full and satisfied for longer. Um, so seeing what you can't, can't add in there to give your, your meals or your snacks, a little bit of a fiber boost also great for gut health, great for regularity. It's great for things like our cholesterol levels, so many things, but just get trying to get a little bit of fiber in there. The next thing is color. This is a really easy piece of gentle nutrition because it, does so much. So color, a lot of the different foods, fruits, veggies, the part of the reason why they get the different color is some different nutrients in there. So if you can just look at your plate or look at not even your plate, but if you could just zoom out to your day and ask yourself, did I get a couple different colors in there? That's a really good place to start. One thing that I do I make this breakfast. I call it smoothie cereal. I know it sounds really weird, but guys stick with me. It is like fruit and then yogurt. I use, I like fiber one cereal, get me a little fiber on there. Um, and then I put some peanut butter on there and then you pour milk on top of it. I think yogurt is too thick for a bowl. And I think just milk is too thin. So I mix them together. But one thing I do gentle nutrition wise there is every week or so I try to buy different fruit from the store and get myself a mix of that color in there. Easy piece of gentle nutrition. Um, And the last one is satisfaction. So we want to make doing the previous things sound good, right? We want to enjoy them. Also one thing about color, it's going to increase your mindfulness in the meal. So that's a really great, great tip there, but allowing ourselves to add satisfaction. Is that taking the veggies or the fruit and adding something on top? Maybe you add a dash of cinnamon to your banana to make it taste better or everything but the bagel seasoning to your broccoli, your roasted broccoli. What Parmesan cheese is also really good on that. What can I do to add a little bit of satisfaction? So if you're like, okay, Colleen, what are those things? You can use the little phrase, my friend Colleen suggests macronutrients, fiber, color, satisfaction. I also have a link to a download. I can get that to you guys if we can share it. Um, it's got like a just screensaver that you can put on your phone to remember those things. Um, so that's where I really recommend starting. And then, I mean, guys, we could nerd out about things like the specific types of fiber, like beta glucan and all of those things, different types of dairy, but we'll, we'll reel it in here. And that's, that's where I'd recommend starting. I'm obsessed with the, my friend, (laughs) that is so awesome. That worked out so perfectly with your name. It did. Oh my God. I have to ask what came first, like you figuring out those four, those four components. Are you thinking of like the acronym? I think I came up with the components first and Uh that's where I feel like my career just worked out somehow. Like how could we get (laughs) creative with this and and make this fit? So I'm glad it worked out. That's awesome. (laughs) I love that. And that's so cool that you have like a screen saver. If you're definitely able to share that or like, yes. even if you have a link to it, we yes, could, I'll get to we'll the share link. it so we can direct people on over to that. I'm, Cause I'm sure people will be just as excited as we are about it. Yeah. That's so cool. Okay, Colleen. So one more question for you on the gentle nutrition topic. Are there any times when 
our listeners or individuals in general should not utilize this part of intuitive eating. Yes. I think that it's important to not use it if it would take away from your satisfaction or enjoyment with the meal. I think asking yourself that question is going to be important, but there's also going to be times when we can't, right? We don't always have control over things. Accessibility is a huge thing too. I mean, if you are in a Let's say, I was just talking about this in my Instagram stories yesterday about yogurt. I all oh, yogurt is such a confusing topic for people. Um, I think it's because there's so many options out there and there's one's always on coming on the market. That's quote unquote better than the last. And it can get confusing. So let's talk about yogurt as an example. So someone might, you know, if they are fine with either, it wouldn't take away from their satisfaction and or enjoyment with the yogurt. And they are like, okay, cool. I'm fine with a lower sugar yogurt. I have a- access to that. That is fine for me, but someone else, maybe their store doesn't have the fancy lower sugar option. And that's a real thing that I think a lot of people need to kind of discuss or if we go to a work lunch and we get boxed lunches and all the sandwiches are on white bread and not whole wheat bread, like we can't control that. Right. And that's really, I think those situations are really where we start to understand, okay, is this true gent nutrition preference, or is this a food rule that I have been kind of disguising as gent nutrition and I'm now being, you know, I have to face it. So seeing if there's any guilt, stress, or anxiety that, comes up in that. Um, I had that happen to me yesterday in the grocery store. I was buying hamburger buns and I was like, you know, I would prefer a whole wheat hamburger bun. I just, for me, I like their, that they're a little heartier. I like that there's some fiber in there. That's going to keep me full longer. There's, you know, other different nutrient benefits there, but they only had plain white ones. I'm not going to freak out about it. Right. It's fine. Um, so I think that if it would, to answer your question, don't implement judge nutrition if it would take away from your satisfaction or enjoyment with the meal or not implementing it would cause you guilt, stress, or anxiety. But also if you just can't, right? If it's going to cause you literally, you don't have access to it, or it's going to cause you a bunch of mental stress, don't implement it. I feel like that's one of, there's tons, but a really big perk of not being on a diet is like, you don't have to stress about getting mm-hmm. the white instead of the wheat. I've heard some people say they have to do like this white whale diet where they don't eat anything white, like white bread, white rice, mm-hmm. whatever. And so I was thinking of that when you were telling that story and I'm like, that person would not have been able to maybe get through that trip because they couldn't have gotten yeah. the brown bread instead of the white. And that could have been like a whole day, just like ruined because of that. So yeah. the beauty of intuitive eating is like, as long as it doesn't impact you and your taste and your satisfaction and all of that, get the white. That's totally fine. Mm -hmm. You can get that fiber elsewhere and still be totally fine. Exactly. There's other ways that you can implement gem nutrition. I can have some, I love making air fried carrots. They're so good. Um, I can have some of that with it. That can be a a form of gem nutrition. You don't, it's not an all or nothing thing. It's not like I have to implement everything that Colleen said or none of it. Like there are some days when, I mean, maybe I don't have a ton of color in my meals. That's okay. Or, you know, if I were to have the fiber cereal when I really wanted the fruit loops, right. Then it's, it's okay. It's not an all or nothing thing. It's, it's gentle. I think our last question for you though, is if you have any advice for how our listeners can get started on their intuitive eating journey, just in general. We always get asked about like first steps and what do I do first? I feel like there's so much to it and not really a distinguished, like this is step number one, or this Mm -hmm. is where you should start. And I want to hear your thoughts and kind of where people can get started and what they can do. And I'll, I'll spill all the tea for you right now. The exact five steps that I recommend. And first thing, I think we need to really understand why diets, I go to the stats first. I go to looking at the data because to me that lays a solid foundation that gives you motivation to actually do all of this stuff. So I have tons of resources on my blog. I'm sure you guys have others that you can recommend for where to start. But I think that looking at the cold, hard facts of dieting and what it actually does to our body, what, what actually does determine our health is really important. And also getting into 
what I talk about a lot, the set point weight theory and how we don't actually have as much control over our weight as we think in terms of how is, are we going to live our healthiest lives? And I think when we can start to really come to terms with those things and wrap our heads around it a little bit more, that's really laying kind of the solid foundation. So that's the first, the first step that I teach in the society, um, which is my intuitive eating community. And then that's when we then go on to more of the biological side of things. So getting strong hunger and fullness cues back, eating enough. A lot of people talk about a question I get asked is, okay, well, what about my metabolism? Everyone's so obsessed with metabolism. It's such a big buzzword. And this is really the process of kind of quote unquote, revving our metabolism, getting basically getting our body back to functioning properly. I want people to think less about where is my metabolism at and more of, is my body adequately fueled? Is my body functioning properly? That's all we really need to focus on. So eating enough, getting those basic carbs, set and protein in there, getting strong hunger and fullness cues and understanding what foods, what types of foods, what amounts of foods are satisfying to you. So really focusing on the biological and then moving on to the psychological. So making peace with the chocolate cake, making peace with eating two slices of bread and I can't stress this enough because I did not do it this way and it caused me to ping pong back and forth. I always talk about this story of I was in college and I was like, I'm done with dieting. I'm going to break my food rules. And I went right for the chocolate cake there. I'm specifically thinking of this one chocolate cake. And that was kind of my, my first step. And I think a lot of people do this on Instagram. Like, okay, I'm going to go to the store and stock my pantry. I don't recommend doing that because let's think about it for a second. Of course, I'm not going to know how to stop eating the chocolate cake. If I have no sense of my hunger and fullness cues, if my body is screaming for energy because it's been restricted for so long, of course, I'm not going to know how to stop. And then it just made me feel so out of control. So do this stepwise process. And then even when we get into break or breaking our food rules, do that stepwise, start with the easiest one, then work to the hardest one. And then we get into to gentle nutrition. So I think that the first steps are to do a little bit more learning. And I think everyone should read the actual intuitive eating book because that really helps kind of weed out the misinformation that's on Instagram a lot of the time. So I always tell people, even if they work with me at all, I'm like, okay, you know, I will tell you everything you need to know, but it's going to hit differently if you actually read the book too. And that is one thing that I've noticed people who make the most progress, the fastest are those who take the time to say, okay, I'm going to, you know, learn everything I can and read the actual intuitive eating book versus just do what I'm being told to do. Um, like I said, I think the way they explain it, it's a little different than the way I explain it. And it gives you some different perspectives and it allows you to come to your own conclusions versus just doing what someone tells you. So those are my, my little roadmap that I'd recommend. I think those are really good starting points and very realistic. I always talk about like realistic goals. I feel like those are very realistic to start off with and definitely reading the book will help a lot to understand kind yeah. of the why. Yes. Yeah. It's not the most sexy approach. I always say, I mean, the sexy thing to do is go to the store. I'm going to get all the, I'm for me, I'm thinking of like those little Debbie oatmeal pies. I'm going to buy the ice cream. I'm going to buy the, you know, all of the things. And that is typically too overwhelming for most people. It's exciting. Yes. But it is just going to be a little bit too much of a shock to the system for most people. So I don't recommend doing that. Yeah. Same. We'll link the book below so you guys know what we're talking about. We talk about it all the time, Emily and I do, but yeah, the one we're talking about, we will be sure to link. Okay, Colleen, we like to have our listeners, or excuse me, our guests when they come on and they really get into their, their topic, be able to kind of sum it up for our listeners. If they happen to, <laughs> for some reason, fast forward to the very end, if you could kind of put <laughs> it all in like a few sentences or a few thoughts, what would you kind of say about this topic? I think for me, intuitive eating should be freeing. It should allow you to enjoy life, but it should also feel good and support your physical health as well. It's really about tying those things in. Intuitive eating should feel good. That's summing it up in a nutshell. And if it doesn't, whether it is mentally or physically, then maybe we're not fully eating intuitively. So let's dive into that a little bit deeper. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. 
Okay, let's get into the bonus question. Yay. Um, we love this part of the episode. It kind of takes away from what we do all day talking about nutrition, which we love, but it's fun to talk about other things sometimes. Um, for our listeners who are just tuning in, if you're a fan of Colleen and you kind of found us that way, our bonus question is where we kind of have a little debate, a little, most of just us giving our opinions, but our bonus question <laughs> today, and we let our guests go first. So Colleen, chicken tenders or chicken nuggets, which one would you prefer? And kind of the why I'd say too. I would go chicken tender. Um, I sometimes feel like chicken nuggets have too much. The ratio is off of breading to chicken. I don't know. I just like chicken tenders. I think they're also like more fun. Um, I, and I also feel like sometimes chicken nuggets can be awkward. Like, do you do it in one bite? Do you take multiple bites? Like, do you then double dip? Like, I don't know. So it's just, I feel like chicken tenders for me. Um, a part two that you did not prepare for, but what dipping sauce is your favorite for chicken tenders? I'd say honey mustard. Ooh, I have to agree with you on that one. It's it's pretty close between honey mustard and barbecue sauce, but I just think that a good honey mustard done right, or I have a recipe on my blog for copycat Chick-fil-A sauce. That is really good because you kind of got both of those things in there. So yeah, maybe, maybe that copycat Chick-fil-A sauce would be like a good combo of those two. So good. That sounds so good. <laughs> okay, Emily, how about you? What's your choice? I don't know this about you, so I'm excited to hear your answer. I am also team chicken tenders because I like the texture a lot better. I like them when they're, I feel like they're normally crispier when they're chicken tenders. And I really like that aspect of it. And I feel, I don't know. I think I agree. It's so like the ratio, I feel like it's a bit mm-hmm. better. I don't know specifically about what, but chicken tenders, they also like, sometimes the shakes kind of freak me out. Just <laughs> I'm like, what am I looking at? <laughs> but definitely chicken tenders. And then my favorite sauce is honey mustard too. So. Well, this might be the first ever three for three with a guest. <laughs> I have to agree with the chicken tenders and actual honey mustard too. So that's hilarious. That has like never happened in the history of this podcast. No. <laughs> I will say though, if a chicken nugget is shaped like something, that's a game changer. Oh, like true. Yes, if it is yes, like a like dino chicken nugget oh, or like yes. a star yes. or a crown or something like that. I am, it's kind of like when any food is like holiday colored or something like that, it immediately makes it more fun. Like yeah. even like I'm thinking of tortilla chips when they get like red and green ones around oh, yeah. Christmas time. I'm like, that just is, that goes into guys, the satisfaction of it. It doesn't mm-hmm. always have to be just about the actual food that you're eating, but just kind of the even presentation of foods just can play a huge role in like our enjoyment with the meal. Emily and I so are true. pumpkin spice fanatics. So yeah. like come <laughs> August, we just like, we like go berserk. <laughs> So like that just proves the point that like just the marketing of that can improve the satisfaction for us in that way. (laughs) Yes. So we like to give our guests the floor at the end of our episode and kind of share with our listeners where they can find you if they want to hear more because you know he and I really enjoyed our episode today but people want to hear more about kind of what your thoughts are or whatever or even if they want to work with you kind of give us that info where they can find you any links and whatnot. Well, any, we're going to link everything you've said too, but just kind of right now, if you'd like to share. Yes. I feel like I am all over the place. I, uh, on Instagram at no.food.rules and you can follow the society, which is my intuitive eating membership community at the underscore society spelled E A T Y. Cause we are a community that actually eats. Um, and then on YouTube, Colleen Christensen, TikTok at no.food.rules. Um, lots of, lots of fun stuff there. So you can also go to my website, Colleen Christensen, nutrition.com, tons of resources there. And we can link, like I said, that Judge Nutrition cheat sheet. Um, and then I also have a fun, fun quiz, but I'd love to hang out with you guys. You can find me 99% of the time on my Instagram stories, dancing in my kitchen with my dog. So <laughs> it's always a fun time. <laughs> well, Colleen, we cannot thank you enough for being on today. This is an amazing episode. We know our listeners are going to love it. I actually have um, a client who I recommended you to, or to, I recommended you to her. I told her that we were having you on the podcast. And so I know at least one person is going to love this, if not like hopefully like tons of others. Um, But again, thank you so, so much for being on today. 
Yes. Thank yes. you guys for having me. It was a blast. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Emily, I'm so sorry. Colleen, Emily and I have this like running thing where Emily <laughs> always gets stuck doing the outro and for some reason it's always a struggle. I can never do it right. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for tuning in for today's episode. We hope you took something away from us. You learned at least one thing about gentle nutrition intuitive eating. Otherwise, definitely be sure to go check out all of Colleen's in social medias and links and everything we're gonna link below and whatnot otherwise we will talk to you next week <laughs> and see you then <laughs> yes thank you guys so much for listening see you next week all right bye, bye. <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in on this episode of the upbeat dietitians with your host emily krause and hannah thompson we appreciate you all so much for continuing to support us in order to support us and sustain the success of this podcast, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. If you'd like to provide us feedback for future episodes and guest stars, follow us on Instagram at The Upbeat Dietitians. Lastly, you can show us support by providing a monthly donation using the link at the end of our bio. Once again, thank you so much for listening today and stay tuned next Wednesday for a new episode. Until then, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.